In this video, we will discuss wind energy. We will summarize how electricity is generated using wind turbines, describe where the greatest wind energy resources are in the U.S., and discuss why offshore wind may be advantageous relative to onshore development in some areas. We will also describe what the human and environmental arguments are for and against wind energy. Wind energy is a renewable energy source that is not carbon-based, so it does not add greenhouse gases or other air pollutants once it is constructed. A few years ago, wind energy surpassed hydropower in the U.S. as the largest renewable energy source. By the first few months of 2020, wind energy accounted for more than 9% of total electricity generation in the U.S. Note, that's 9% of electricity and a smaller component of overall energy production, which includes things like fossil fuels used for transportation. Wind, energy, and solar power are the fastest growing renewable energy sources in the U.S. and the world. But wind turbines have a key advantage over solar power. They can generate power at night and on cloudy days. This leads to a higher energy return on investment, or EROI, for wind power, which is currently 18, compared to 10 for solar power. However, because both wind and solar are intermittent energy sources, we still have needs for battery storage or other power sources during wind lulls. Another advantage of wind energy relative to other forms of renewable energy is that it can be generated on both land and offshore, as long as there are areas of consistent winds. We have been making use of the power of wind for centuries for milling grains, as shown in the 17th century windmill in the UK, pumping water, here a windmill in Australia, and now for generating electricity. Wind turbines were first used to generate electricity in rural areas in the early 1900s, but electrification projects that connected rural areas to the grid caused a decline in wind electricity generation. Using wind for electricity generation caught on again in the 1980s and really took off in the early 2000s with the advent of modern turbines like the one shown on the right. Wind turbines are also making a comeback as a vital energy source in remote areas and island communities where it may be difficult to connect to the electrical grid and where renewable energy is a more, is a more reliable source than deliveries of fossil fuels. Here's a wind turbine being installed on the Alaskan tundra. So how does a wind turbine work? Wind turbines convert kinetic energy into electrical energy. The moving wind spins the turbine blades, which are connected to a drive shaft. The drive shaft turns an electrical generator to produce electricity. This electricity can then be transmitted to where it is needed via the electrical grid. This process of spinning turbines to produce electricity is common to many forms of renewable energy including hydropower and tidal power, and is also how power is generated via steam at nuclear and fossil fuel-based plants. Wind farms are collections of wind turbines located in the same area, and it makes sense to develop wind farms in areas that will maximize the energy produced relative to the cost of building the wind farm. Commercial wind farms tend to be located in areas where the average wind speed is at least 13 miles per hour, or 5.8 meters per second. Those smaller scale turbines can be effective in areas with lower average wind speeds. Good places for wind farms are in areas with open plains or open water, on the tops of rounded hills, and in mountain gaps that funnel and speed up the wind. Getting higher above the ground increases the wind speed, so large turbines can be on towers that are hundreds of feet tall. But we can't just pack wind turbines in tightly in these favorable locations because the turbines are extracting the wind's mechanical energy. In other words, they are slowing it down. This means the turbines create a wind shadow in the downwind direction, and that limits the overall electricity generation possible in a given amount of land. So given these requirements, where can the U.S. generate a lot of wind power? This map shows the average wind speed at a height of 80 meters, or 262 feet, above the ground. Any place that is brown, orange, red, pink, or purple on the map is a place that has an average wind speed worth using for electricity generation. That's a lot of area. Notice how the entire Great Plains and much of the Midwest are appropriate for wind generation, 
as are some places in the mountainous west and northeastern United States. The U.S. is so great for wind power production that the Great Plains have been described as the Saudi Arabia of wind. Based on the map here and how big it is, it might not surprise you that Texas is the number one producer of wind energy in the U.S. This map shows something a little bit different. It's the percent of electricity that comes from wind energy in each state in 2019. Look at how Iowa and Kansas have over 40% of their electricity supplied by wind energy. Oklahoma's over 30%, three more states are over 20%, and eight more states are between 10 and 20%. Remember that more wind energy capacity is being installed each year, particularly in the Great Plains, along with the high capacity transmission lines needed to get energy to population centers, both within the state where the wind farms are and across state lines. The US is also a world leader in wind energy. This graph shows our wind energy capacity relative to other leading wind energy producers. Only China has a higher wind energy capacity and a more rapid rise. Notably, the US's impressive wind energy capacity has been achieved virtually entirely by onshore wind, and as we'll talk about next, offshore wind offers even more potential. Offshore wind generation presents some significant advantages over land-based wind farms. Offshore winds are 70% stronger and more consistent than on land because of land-sea heat differences that set up dependable wind patterns and the fact that the ocean has no topography to disrupt the wind. These factors mean that the same size wind farm can produce three times as much power offshore as it can on land. This photo shows the Lilligrund offshore wind farm between Sweden and Denmark. Here, 48 wind turbines take advantage of winds that are 8 to 10 meters per second, which is equivalent to the windiest places on the Great Plains, and generate electricity for 60,000 homes. Offshore wind has been much more heavily developed along Europe's coastlines than it has in the US, as these maps show, and wind energy now accounts for 15% of the EU's electricity needs, as compared to 9% in the US. Europe even has a few floating wind farms that allow wind energy to be harvested from farther offshore and in deeper water than is possible for those built directly up from the seafloor. In the U.S., the first offshore wind farm began operating in 2016 off of Block Island, Rhode Island. There are five wind turbines generating enough electricity to power 17,000 homes. To date, this is the only commercial offshore wind farm in the U.S. While the U.S. has been a slow starter at offshore wind relative to Europe, there is strong potential for its future development. There are three good reasons why the U.S. has been slow to develop offshore wind. First, it's more expensive than land-based wind farms to develop. Second, we have plenty of land-based wind resources we still haven't developed, just in different parts of the country. Third, there's been opposition to offshore wind from local residents who argue that it would spoil their view. Most European projects are farther offshore than those which have been proposed in the US, and this lowers the visual impact from the shore. This map shows the projected projects off the US East Coast as of 2018, along with the targets different states had set for their offshore wind capacity. Notice that there's one dot in the Great Lakes, that's for a wind farm off of Cleveland in Lake Erie. That's been 13 years in development. This six turbine wind farm would be the first freshwater wind farm in the US. It cleared another regulatory hurdle in September 2020, but it's unclear how long it will be until the project is built. Both those for and against the wind farm are thinking in terms of the potential for much larger wind development in the Great Lakes, and that has made the fights around this pilot project particularly high stakes. This map shows Ohio's wind energy potential based on wind speeds 100 meters above ground level. The green, yellow, and orange colors are places that would be okay, if not great, for wind power. But note the wind speeds over Lake Erie at the top of the map. That's why there is interest in the potential for offshore wind in the Great Lakes which could increase wind energy from the 1.7% of Ohio's electricity that it currently generates.
Now that we've discussed how and where wind energy is converted to electricity, let's consider the human and environmental impacts of wind energy. As mentioned earlier, wind energy is renewable and it produces no air pollution or carbon emissions after construction. But it does create a large above ground footprint and must be located away from buildings. However, land underneath can still be farmed and grazed. This makes land-based wind farms best for development in rural areas, and they require adequate transmission capacity to cities where the power is used. There are three principal objections to wind energy development. First, there have been concerns about birds and bats flying into turbine blades, and it's true that some of the earliest wind projects were built in bird migration flyways. However, wildlife impacts are now assessed carefully in the permitting process and flyway areas are avoided. Still, wind turbines kill about 150,000 to 300,000 birds per year, which sounds like a lot until you compare it to things like cell phone towers and outdoor cats. Outdoor cats kill 1.4 to 3.7 billion birds per year in the U.S. That means cats kill about 10,000 times more birds per year than wind turbines. Researchers are also now figuring out how things like turbine height, blade length, and even color can be used to minimize bird kills. A second objection to wind turbines is noise, but houses are generally not permitted within 300 meters of a wind turbine. And at that distance, a wind turbine is about as noisy as your refrigerator. That's not too bad. Still, people complain about perceived health impacts of wind turbine noise, and the best scientific explanation for those complaints is the concerns about the noise is itself a source of stress that can produce things like disrupted sleep. People also object to wind turbines creating landscape or visual pollution. Basically, they don't want their views disrupted by wind turbines, even if they might generally support renewable energy. Both the noise and visual concerns can also be related to a phenomenon known as not in my backyard, or nimbyism. Finally, there have been recent news stories pointing to the waste problem caused when wind turbine blades reach the end of their useful life, after about 20 years. While 90% of wind turbine parts, including the tower and hub, are metal and can be easily recycled, the blades are made of resin and fiberglass and are not so easy. Disposing of them in landfills is expensive and takes up valuable landfill space, so there is a big incentive to find ways to recycle them. For example, one company is turning them into chips that can be used in decking and pallets. To summarize what we've learned, wind energy is renewable and carbon-free after construction. It has an energy return on investment, or EROI, of 18, which is higher than solar and comparable to oil and gas. The U.S. has abundant wind energy resources, mostly in the Great Plains. Offshore wind has been more widely developed in Europe, but the U.S. also has the potential for future development of this resource. In general, offshore winds are stronger and have greater potential for electricity generation, but cost more to develop. Finally, relative to fossil fuels and other forms of renewable energy, wind has a relatively low environmental impact.